let's start with Chris Hayes. And this is based MSNBC, Joy Reid and Chris Hayes. But that aside, the deeper problem here is that if you spend any time at all reading the Israeli press, listening to what Israeli leaders and commentators are actually saying, it is very clear that for a lot of people in government, the mass destruction of Gaza, raising it like Putin raised Grozny or Assad raised Aleppo, is the point, the goal. Many prominent members of the Israeli governing class don't think there is such a thing as an innocent civilian in Gaza, have said that everyone in Gaza deserves their fate. From Knesset member, mayor of Ben Ari, saying that, quote, the children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves, to an Israeli military spokesman saying the emphasis of Israel's military campaign was, quote, on damage and not on accuracy, to Israel's president, Isaac Herzog, suggesting there are no civilians in Gaza and everyone is a legitimate target, to journalist Shimon Ricklin, who said this on Israeli TV. אני לא נרדם טוב בלי שאני רואה בתים קורסים בעזה. מה אני אעשה? עוד, עוד, עוד בתים, עוד מגדלים, שלא יהיה להם לאן לחזור. So, for those that are listening, this is an Israeli official on some sort of show, and he's basically going ham. He says, I am for war crimes. And then he goes on and says, I do not uh I do not care if I am criticized. I am unable to sleep if I don't see if I don't see houses being destroyed in Gaza. This is what he's saying in this interview. I'll let it play on. That's not a fringe view in Israel. I mean, even the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, invoked the lessons from the biblical story of Amalek and addressed the nation in Hebrew in the end of October. And in that biblical chapter, God commands King Saul on how to respond to an attack by the rival kingdom of Amalek. Quote, now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put them to death, men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. <coughs> Now, I will be the first to confess, the first to confess, I have no idea what to do about Hamas or about what comes next. But the Amalek method cannot be the solution. To be honest, I'm not particularly convinced the Israeli leadership has any idea what will come next. Many want full destruction. And, and Hamas also wants this war. They have been clear on that. I think they want it to continue. They seem to think all of this death and destruction benefits in the end because of the rage it will produce towards Israel. But whatever your views on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it is just plainly the case that our country is supporting a war whose animating moral logic looks to most of the world, and frankly to me, to be that every single last person in Gaza is guilty and deserves their lot. And that is the moral logic of Hamas. It is the moral logic that drove the atrocity of October 7th. And an atrocity like October 7th does not, cannot justify whatever comes after it, whatever the response. There is no terrorist attack, no matter how horrific and truly October 7th was horrific, that can wash clean what we are seeing in Gaza and what we as Americans and our government are abetting. It must end. We must stop it. That's Chris Hayes. Now, it might be that Chris Hayes but that is aside, understanding the deeper that, problem hey, this shit is coming to a close. The writing is on the wall. I need to start trying to save my fucking reputation here. And that could be the case for her also here. But I think there's an added thing for Joy Ann Reed. And that is Joy Ann Reed's family is from the Congo. Her dad, anyway, uh, uh, I covered that before, but I'll let it play. She's talking here um, about Nikki and what she says about what ha what's happening in Palestine. Okay, here was Nikki Haley, supposedly the Republicans' moderate alternative to Trump, talking about Israel and Gaza. Go. All right, I'm when still you here, look now and they thing? talk about a two-state solution, every day that I was at the United Nations, 
It was never Israel opposing a two-state solution. It was always the Palestinians and Iran opposing a two-state solution. They never wanted that because they want to eliminate Israel altogether. So a two-state solution is not a true conversation because if you've ever talked to them, they don't want it. The Palestinians don't want a two-state solution. What I think Israel should do and what I think America should do, we should support whatever Israel thinks will that keep them preposterous. Safe. That is okay, preposterous. Okay, let's get into it. Here's a little bit of the history of the Oslo Accords and a couple of clips about who's for it, meaning the peace process, and who's against it. Roll them. Did you know this peaceful handshake between Israeli and Palestinian leadership was awarded with a Nobel Peace Prize? Yet 30 years later, peace seems like a distant dream. Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly ask that you remain seated during the document signing. The first of the Oslo Accords was signed on 13th September 1993 and should have marked the beginning of the end to the Israeli occupation of Gaza and the West Bank. We have been granted the great privilege of witnessing this victory for peace. Just as the Jewish people this week celebrate the dawn of a new year, let us all go from this place to celebrate the dawn of a new era. After a year of secret meetings in the Norwegian capital, Oslo, after which the accords were named, a plan was established for Israel to withdraw from parts in the West Bank and Gaza. Plans were also made to transfer governing duties to a Palestinian interim government, which later resulted in the creation of the Palestinian Authority. Occupied Palestine was divided in three areas. A. Under full Palestinian control. B. Civil control and Israel and Palestine would have joint security control and C, would be under control of Israel except over Palestinians. Both parties were given five years to follow up on the plan, and afterwards negotiations were set to reach permanent decisions on unresolved issues. A year after signing the Oslo Accords, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to former Palestinian Authority President Yasser Arafat, former Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peres, and former Prime Minister of Israel Yitzhak Rabin for their efforts to create peace in the Middle East. However, the Oslo peace process quickly entered a cycle of failed negotiations until it ultimately collapsed during the 2000 Camp David summit and the Second Intifada. Afterwards, attempts were made to restart negotiations towards a two-state solution, but they never resulted into conclusive agreements. 30 years later, Palestine is still illegally occupied by Israel, and Israeli settlers frequently construct new settlements in occupied Palestine under protection of the Israeli army. In 2019, Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said he would suspend all agreements with Israel after it demolished dozens of Palestinian homes on the outskirts of occupied East Jerusalem. Although Abbas made his threats before without implementing them, in 2020, he also said he would end security agreements with the United States and Israel. And 2022 was the deadliest year for the West Bank since the second intifada. I don't know if it's surprising or shocking. That might be too strong of a word um, to call what Chris Hayes and uh, Joanne Reed have, have been recently doing with some of their coverage on Palestine and Israel. It could be just them realizing that I need to go ahead and make this pivot in order to save face for what obviously is going to end um, terrible, and uh, people are going to be looking at Israel as as it is as the the culprit, and they need to make sure they're on the right side of that. So this could be just self interest and in why they're doing it this way. So I don't give it any more than that, 